All right, everyone, I think we're going to get started because I see all of our speakers for the day are here and um, the program committee is also all here. So I just want to welcome you to the second day of the management techniques and encrypted networks workshop of the Internet Architecture Board. Um, the second day um, is going to be focused on a different topic, but still in the same vein. So just to remind you all the goals of the of the three day uh, meeting are um, to explore the interaction between network management and traffic encryption, um, but also to initiate new work on collaborative approaches that promote both the security and the user privacy requirements, um, as well as the operational requirements. Um, so there are some questions here. I'm not going to go over them, um, but these are sort of guiding questions for um, the workshop itself and how we have also then structured the agenda. Um, we're going to be moving into certainly the second piece right here today. So we're talking about collaborative solutions um, as part of day two. And then hopefully that slides us into the third day where we really get specific on actions. You can have six one in the morning. If you could just mute, unless you are actually trying to talk to me. <laughs> in that case, I can't hear you very well. Um, okay, so the schedule we've already done um, the first day. Tommy was the chair. Um, today we're talking about where we want to go. Um, and this will run for two hours, so um, from now. Um, but we don't have a full two hour agenda for day two, actually. We just have um, essentially one hour booked, which is great because I think that means we have a lot of time for discussion. It also means that where necessary, um, although I will keep time, we can sometimes stretch the queue for um, certain Q&A on talks um, if, if that's what the group feels like we should do. I would prefer actually that we keep the schedule as tight as we can and then for folks who can't get on the queue um, to, to talk about specific papers or presentations, you save it for the end and we kind of talk in a more general way. But we'll just see how it goes, right? So the first um, presentation is gonna be by Richard Barnes. Uh, the title of the talk is What's in it for me? Revising, uh, revisiting the reasons people collaborate, uh, followed by Marcus Ilhar from um, Ericsson on relying on relays, the future of secure communication. And then Michael Wiesel is going to talk about um, PEP functions with the talk, the sidecar opting into PEP functions, followed by discussion with all of you. So that's the day. Um, are there any, should I pause here? Are there any um, issues, questions, things that you want to bring up before we jump in? Sometimes I go too fast. I think one thing I need to remind you of that I've forgotten to do is that we are recording. And so if you have an issue with that or that it would go on YouTube, please either note that um, or speak up. Okay. All right, moving on then. So um, I'll stop sharing here and I'll let Richard go ahead and queue up his slides when he's ready. All right, is that visible? Yes, looks great. All right, thanks Mallory. Um, so this is a little uh, easy non-technical talk to uh, kick off our day today. Um, it's almost kind of not any new content here, but kind of reading some comments, kind of general context into the record to, to get people in the right frame of mind for when we talk about collaborative solutions and kind of set the general frame for how collaboration tends to work in the internet. So the overarching frame here is that, you know, when we do collaborative things in the internet, a prerequisite for that collaboration to happen is that the two collaborating, two or more collaborating parties all need to see some benefit in this. They need to see benefits from collaborating and those benefits need to be worth whatever costs those uh, parties incur by collaborating. Um, you know, Typically, when we're in the internet environment, we're talking about voluntary uh, collaborations, not things that are mandated by, you know, regulations or uh, some you know, contracts or what have you. So in those sort of situations, in order for collaboration to come about, there need to be motives on both sides to kind of drive the two sides together. Now, typically, when you say the word collaboration, this is the kind of scenario you think about, you know, I, 
I know Marcus or I know Michael and I'm going to, you know, we're, we've uh, met each other. We've uh, established a relationship and we're going to work together to solve a problem. That is actually not at all what collaboration tends to look like when we talk about collaborative solutions in the internet. It's more like these scenarios where you're at the coffee shop, you know, you're at the table by yourself, you need to go to the bathroom. And so you ask the, the kind person next to you who you've never met before to watch your laptop while you have to step away. Now, I've, of course, I've illustrated this uh, evil person because you have no idea who this person is. Uh, you just met, they could be, you know, some uh, completely evil person, agents of the secret police or what have you. Um, and so you're, you're putting your stuff at risk by leaving it with them. Um, and, you know, you're accepting uh, some risk by doing this. And so you're probably not gonna like leave your laptop totally unlocked so that they can uh, rifle through it, um, you know, steal all your stuff, log into your accounts. Um, you know, check your email, what have you. You're probably going to at least lock your laptop, you know, close the lid and bef before you hand it over to these people. So, you know, th there's, there's kind of this, you know, uh, I, I just met you sort of interaction um, where you have, you're going to take some precautions. You're going to structure the collaboration so that the risk you take on here is bounded. And this is a, a kind of a much better metaphor for, for how collaboration, uh, I'm going to make air quotes around collaboration because it's, it's different from the usual sense of the word, but the kind of metaphor here for the, the I just met you metaphor um, is a little bit more accurate for how collaboration tends to work in the internet because these collaborations tend to be structured around things like open interoperable interfaces um, and discovery of capabilities. So when I wander onto the coffee shop network before I go to the bathroom, you know, my laptop has never met that uh, network before. Um, you know, I've had to ask the barista for the Wi-Fi password, and I'm trusting that network with, just by using the network, I'm trusting the network to see some things about me and exposing some information to it. Uh, I'm exp uh, trusting it uh, to tamper or not tamper with uh, certain things about what I'm doing. So um, it, that's the sort of uh, collaboration uh, framework that we have when we talk about um, collaboration in internet technologies. And so what that means when we talk about collaboration in the internet, because we have this kind of discovery-based just met you frame for the collaboration, the collaborations that we have, in addition to having net benefit, they need to be structured so that each side still gets that net benefit even when the other side acts adversarially. So in the worst case, um, you know, it's still worth it to me to uh, participate in this collaboration. And you know, that, that calculus can be including you know, probability distributions, much like when I, I leave my laptop with the guy next to him, you know, I, I'm making a, prob a probability calculation uh, that he's probably not gonna do, uh, you know, walk off with it, say. Um, but you know, regardless, there, there is, you know, the adversarial possibilities here come into that calculation. Now, for this workshop, we're looking specifically at uh, collaboration around encrypted uh, application technologies uh, and network management. So those two specific things. And when we look at the, that, um, you know, that sort of interaction, there's kind of two sides to it. There's, I call it an inside and an outside. An inside in the sense of an actor in the collaboration who has access to the unencrypted data who knows the full details of the interaction. Typically, this is something that's up toward the application layer where the, uh, the implementer of the system or the software is acting as the user's agent. They're, they're the ones who are authorized to handle the data in question. And on the other side, there's someone who is outside the encryption uh, in the sense that they can only see the ciphertext, uh, the encrypted data uh, going past. And so uh, the idea is that the person who's outside the encryption wants to know something that's on the inside in order to make the system work together. So they might want to know that this is a, a real-time video flow, for example, that a certain, a certain flow of packets constitute a video stream, um, when um, they might not be able to, uh, may or may not be able to infer that from, from the uh, encrypted packets themselves. And so, yeah, when we talk about collaboration in this domain, we're talking about collaboration between one, this person who is um, on the inside, who's building a system that is acting, uh, who's authorized to access data, that's acting typically on a user's behalf, and someone who's on the outside of the encryption who is um, you know, acting on the network's behalf, trying to optimize the network, you know, usually to some um, 
uh, benefit for the end user as well, but um, again, at, at one more uh, hop removed. What this, you know, the, the, the nature of that structure means that in order to get the inside actor involved here, you know, the, the benefit that is articulated here, at least part of it, needs to be meaningful to the user. So, you know, if, if the benefit that we're getting out of this interaction, if the benefit that accrues from, you know, a certain type of collaboration is only to make it cheaper to operate the network, say, that's not a salient benefit to me as the user of the network. Like, or it's very, I, the benefit of that is very attenuated. Like maybe I get you know, saved you know, five bucks on my network bill at the end of the month. But, you know, if, if that requires me revealing a whole bunch of my private information, I'm probably not going, that's probably not a net benefit to me. Um, and as, you know, if, if I'm acting as a, um, an application vendor, you know, if, I, I, you know, if I'm Mozilla or if I'm uh, Cisco making WebEx, I've got to take that sort of trade off into account across my user base and make that, you know, uh, aggregate uh, decision as to whether I'm going to build the features to engage in this benefit that's primarily accruing benefit to, to network operators only marginally benefiting my users. Um, so that's kind of feeds into that calculation. So the, the, ch the collaborations that have the greatest chance of success here are the ones where there's mutual benefit, where there's in some benefits to the network. Obviously, that's why a lot of this stuff is being proposed. But there also needs to be some benefit on the user side so that the party who's on the inside who has access to the plain text can understand why they're getting some benefit uh, that, that counter that balances against the cost uh, uh, that they're taking on by exposing some information that would otherwise be encrypted and protected from the network. So I mean, this kind of naturally raises the question, are there ever situations where this uh, this alignment of interest arises? Are the interests of the network ever well aligned with, with the interests of the user? I mean, clearly, you know, you know, cost savings kind of should fit in that, like I just mentioned. Uh, but, you know, are there more interesting ones where there might be worth uh, collaboration? So just to cite a few examples, like I, I already cited this idea that just by connecting to a network, I'm already making a trade-off where I'm trading uh, a certain degree of uh, privacy and a certain degree of risk of the network tampering with my data um, in order to get access to the internet. So that 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 basic trade-off um, is clearly worth it for, for a vast majority of everyone connected to the internet from billions of users around the world. Um, so at least at that level, level the basic trade-off is there. Um, at a slightly more, more nuanced, more interesting view, um, we see a few technologies that are in wide use today where um, you know, getting a little bit more speed or do, getting a little bit more uh, open connectivity is traded off uh, in exchange for a little bit more information about uh, what the user is doing. I'm thinking here of things like UPnP, like Stun, where when I'm setting up a real-time session, I say, hey, dear network, I'm uh, you know, dear, dear Nat, I am setting up a, a session where I'm going to need some extended connectivity. Please open up some ports for me and let some UDP packets through um, and probably you know, give them some, ideally, you know, give them nice priority and things like that. Um, so, so that kind of asking for additional connectivity, asking for additional additional speed is is a domain where we have some some demonstration of of this alignment of interests. And then the uh, uh, the, the mysterious dog at the bottom is a, a forward pointer to a talk Tommy's going to give a little bit later about uh, a thing an idea we've been discussing called Red Rover, um, which uh, Red Rover under the theory that the the application and the network operator can kind of join arms and, and block malicious stuff going through. So I think there's some security possibilities here as well, where the security interests of uh, the uh, uh, application on the one side and of the network on the other side uh, can align and you know, work together to, to increase the overall security of the system. So there's a few examples here of situations where user meaningful net benefit accrues even in the presence of, of adversarial behavior by uh, one side or the other. So yeah, that's, that's kind of the overall framing. I just kind of wanted to lay out for the rest of the discussions here. Um, whenever we're talking about uh, one of these proposals to have more collaboration between the network uh, to make the network better and the application to make an application better, we need to get both of those sides. So, uh, you know, if you're, if you're living on the network side, you're probably used to thinking about how they, making things better for the network. But when we start talking collaboratively, you need to also kind of take into account what the interests are of the folks you want to collaborate with in order to articulate why it's interesting for both parties to get involved in this. That's all I had. Thanks.
Great. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. Um, really great timing as well. <laughs> um, would folks like to get in the queue? I think as um, per last or per yesterday, we were um, putting ourselves in the queue with a plus one. Thank you for demonstrating that, Michael. Uh, go ahead. Just with a smile. Um, so this is interesting because I'm going to be talking about a chunk of this tomorrow in my ideas on network contracts. But one of the things I'm curious about here, Richard, because um, I'm coming mostly from a um, OPSEC perspective, but what do you think in terms of malicious actors and this kind of collaboration, in particular deceptive uh, elements? Uh, how would you see that operating in this environment? Um, yeah, so, so clearly, and uh, uh, that was one of my, my key points here is that um, it's, you know, I think each side in this interaction is going to regard, you know, when we talk about these collaborations, it's it's natural for each side to regard the other as potentially malicious. Um, you see this with, for example, the uh, DNS encryption, where, you know, for a long time, uh, the network was was highly trusted and not regarded as malicious with regard to DNS traffic. And there was a lot of experience that showed that that was um, an ill-founded assumption, which led to the efforts going on now to protect DNS traffic from inspection and tampering. Um, and the, the, it goes the other way as well, where the network is going to regard um, applications and, and endpoints as malicious. You know, the, the whole history of firewalls and network enforced security uh, is, is grounded in that assumption. Um, and so, you know, the, these collaborations are going to need to be structured to, to take those assumptions into account. Um, I, I expect, um, and some more of this will come up in, in Red, Red Rover stuff that Tommy has. Um, I expect what we'll see is um, kind of a, a building up where you know, there's a baseline of non-collaborative stuff. Um, things like you know, if, if we take the, the filtering malicious content example, um, you know, we've had firewalls forever. That's a non-collaborative approach because the network is unilaterally imposing uh, its will on, on the endpoint. Um, you know, if we have some collaborative approaches that might you know, get some, you know, if, if you, you, you might say, you know, if you engage in this collaborative approach, you get out of, of the strict some of the, some some of the firewall rules, maybe, right? So I think we'll we'll see a combination of these non-collaborative approaches as kind of a backstop for the collaborative approaches. Um, but you, you know, it'll be interesting to see. Like I said, obviously, you know, the idea that the various actors might be adversarial or deceptive is going to need to be in, uh, incorporated in how these collaborations are structured. Um, and I think there you you can have you know different le different you know, levels of trust, different levels of collaboration um, combined together to um, kind of piece together a whole picture. Okay. So I just uh, if it's okay, I've got one little annotative point to add to this. If that's okay, Mallory. Okay. Um, there's one other thing I was thinking about this, Richard, which is, or sorry, Mike, uh, yeah, sorry, um, which is, I think that this approach is more viable now in a more IoT dominated world where a lot of the traffic is now much more mechanically driven and simpler than it was historically. Talking about this in terms of a general purpose laptop, for example, I think would be uh, extremely difficult, but I've just been thinking about that as a function of technical change. That's actually a really good point. Um, and another example uh, that folks might be useful for us to keep in mind is, is MUD or manufacturer usage descriptions, which is, you know, technology that has been, I think, deployed some in the IoT domain, where an IoT device that has a constrained uh, traffic profile but might be compromised, you know, in, in, in correct operation has a constrained, constrained traffic profile, can declare that traffic profile to the network so the network for, can enforce it. So that if the IoT device is compromised and starts generating other types of traffic, that traffic will be blocked by the network. So it's sort of the uh, the device declaring its intent to the network, so the network can uh, guard against compromising the device. But no, yeah, no, as, no. You, as you say, the, the the mechanical nature of the IoT thing enables that. The limited use uh, uh, mm -hmm. nature of the IoT thing makes that possible. Okay. Cool. Uh... I, I can post a link to that in the chat. I I might have just found out that my entire talk tomorrow is moot. This is great. <laughs> okay. Hey, uh, Michael. I don't know if you want to come on mic with your comment, but we have um, a few minutes, a couple minutes. Hi, Richard. I like your laptop 
uh, and coffee shop situation, but I'm, I'm just having difficulty understanding how that is a collaboration with the other person. Um, and I guess I wrote that, you know, maybe there's some analogy here to me leaving my packets with my ISP and hoping that, um, when I go to the bathroom, um, but. Um, I guess I'm just trying to, to to bring that analogy full circle to understand how it does and whether how we can leverage it better. <clears throat> yeah, I, I don't think I was trying to get super detailed in terms of the, the mechanics of how that would work um, compared to, to an internet uh, technology thing. Um, it's, it's mainly that, you know, we have an objective there of, you know, my my objective as as a laptop owner is to you know go to the bathroom and not take my laptop with me there, not have to pack all my stuff back up, um, and I can't achieve that objective on my own. I need to you know, we need two two people in this case, and so I have enlisted the the person next to me, but I've enlisted him in this in this effort because I, one I need him, and because you know, much like you know I need a, a network to get to the rest of the internet, um, and um, I've done it despite the fact that I don't have any information about how trustworthy this this person is. Done much like you know, I have no idea how trustworthy the uh, the network in my my local Starbucks is. They could be, you know, like I said, agents of the secret police or what have you. So it's mainly to kind of capture those two aspects. Um, we have two more comments, and I'm going to cut the queue because we only have two minutes left for this section. So, um, Torlis, go ahead. Thanks, uh, Richard. So maybe maybe the the term collaboration is 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 a little bit difficult, but I think if I'm because I'm I'm guessing how to interpret the concept. So let's let's take the firewall, right? So is it is it uh, fair to say that if I was uh, you know trying to communicate with some other end and there is a firewall, I was explicitly aware of the firewall. Um, I could authenticate the firewall, and only you know if I could authenticate the firewall trusted, then I would maybe relinquish sufficient information that the firewall would allow me to talk to the other side. So just like you know, a policeman um, that, that stops me, asks for, for my credentials, I want to get to the other side because alcohol is being served there. So, uh, you know, there is a check for, for my age or something like that. So an explicit interaction with such a security uh, wall. Um, is, is, is that what you call collaboration then, as opposed to, you know, it's a black hole. Uh, you have no idea why you can't talk to the other side. Um, yes, I'm not, I, I was thinking of it less uh, from the framework of, of knowing why something's happen, happening as uh, and more from the idea of um, providing some, you know, have, having some explicit interaction. Um, in the in the firewall case, right? Like the endpoint has no choice in the matter, um, and they they take no they're, the way the endpoint acts is no different if a firewall is there than um, you know if they were if, if it wasn't there, right? There, there's the endpoint doesn't know about the firewall and it doesn't change its behavior if the firewall is there or it's, if it's not. But I, I think your example of you know a firewall where um, you know, there's some interaction, maybe the, the application exposes some information um, that, that proves that it's, you know, healthy um, and gets extra access that way. Um, th those sort of remote attestation things you could put in, in as, as collaborations, I think that would fit accurately in that bucket. I mean, you, you could potentially even also include things like um, TLS inspecting firewalls, where um, the willingness to trust an additional enterprise trust anchor um, was that that kind of connection and collaboration? So the the TLS inspecting thing was able to is able to do its you know uh, impersonation of of remote sites um, and act as as a more trusted agent. That's a little bit of a stretch, but it, it, you know it, it, I think you could it's still kind of within the overall envelope of the term. Yeah, I mean I I think it would really be useful to come kind of to better terms with that terminology with these. Um, maybe boring, but uh, I think a lot more, you know, business critical issues um, than than um, coffee shops, right? I mean, we've we've been starting to do things like mud. Where does that fall, you know, on this on this collaborative 
on the place where we would want to go to, right? Then we've been removing the ability to inspect uh, certificates with TLS 1.3. Is there a way to get that back in a way that uh, the, 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 the endpoint does benefit from it? So I think we, we, we do have a good range of, you know, really important, um, you know, uh, technical aspects of this collaboration in the IETF and coming from, from the industry. Um, so I, I, I certainly would hope that uh, we can get uh, uh, some steps forward in, in, in this process. Yeah, I, mean, I think broadly the way the, the call for proposals for this workshop envision collaboration, if I may speak for the organizers, is that, you know, in, since we're talking about encrypted apps in the network, I think the, the sort of collaboration that folks were envisioning was where some, in, some information the application would have otherwise encrypted and protected is exposed somehow to the network for the network's use in network management. Um, and so that's the sort of interaction that would comprise a collaboration. Right, but there was kind of the, the difference between explicitly intending um, for that information to be given to a third party that uh, has an impact on the uh, communication channel versus what where we started out from, which is, you know, passive observation of something that wasn't even meant for the network, right? So, I mean, that evolution, driving that evolution. Yep. Yep. Um, okay, Rob. Uh, yeah, thank you, Richard. This description. I think I actually really like it. I think it it's sort of sort of common sense, really, that there's two parties at play, or at least two parties at play in these services, and they both need to get something out of that relationship. I think that that is quite a good way of framing the conversation in terms of saying what information should we expose to the network potentially in different cases, and what's helpful, and, and that sort of balance. So I quite like the overall way you describe this. One question I do have, though, is that the slides you have sort of depict two actors at play, um, the end user and the network talk to each other. But in many cases, are there not more than two uh, parties that are involved in these sort of decisions? Uh, if you're a parent, uh, you might be, or a school, for example, you want to be protecting other users on their behalf. Um, and hence, I wonder how that sort of fits into your picture. Or maybe it's government policy constraints um, as well, or an enterprise, et cetera. So, I wonder if, if, although it's quite nice to look at this as just two parties, I think there's more players involved in these sort of choices and decisions. And how does that that sort of get into this model effectively? Yeah, I mean, obviously, in the full real world picture, there are, there are a bunch of, of folks who have equities in this decision. Um, there, there's the direct user of the device, as you said, parents or, or uh, school net, uh, uh, school administrators or uh, regulators all have some say in this. I mean, to, to be a little pointed about it, um, you know, ultimately, what is you know, the folks you need to convince are the folks who write code, um, right? So, you know, whoever, to some degree, like the vendors are kind of a swing point and ultimately the vendors, um, you know, interest of their users, the, the regulatory constraints of the markets they're trying to sell into will, will shape what the vendors do as well as the vendor's own interest. But, you know, when, when we're talking about creating a technical thing, the folks uh, kind of writing the code, making the, the various devices, are the ones um, who are, are the, the kind of crux where all those, those interests come together. Uh, yes, thank you. I'll defer further conversation to later. Thanks. I, actually, in the internet context, I'll highlight one more thing, um, which is that you can have kind of multiple entities involved in the sense that if you are revealing information just you know by by putting it in packets, obviously uh, you know, a packet will transit multiple networks on the way, and so you, you can kind of inadvertently, uh, if you don't design it for a specific recipient, come uh, involve leaking information. Uh, inadvertently uh, leaking information to multiple parties in that way as well. That's why routing is so important, but that's a different conversation. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Richard. <laughs> um, we're going to go ahead and now move on to Marcus's talk. Um, so again, 15.5, really appreciate all of the um, the comments in the queue. Sorry, Nalini, we couldn't get to your question, but we'll we'll have time for discussion at the end. and. I'm sure there will be themes that connect all three for that discussion. So go ahead, Marcus, if you want to uh, start sharing your slides, I'll turn it over to you. Sure. <clears throat> we can see that. Looks great. Great. Okay. So, uh, hi, everyone. I'm Marcus. I'm Ericsson. 
uh, and I'll be talking a little bit about one way of doing collaboration and a little bit on how, what, what kind of things mobile operators have been using a lot of the information that have been available to them. And um, so go in a little bit to that and then talk a little bit about how we can do things in a more collaborative way uh, in the future. Um, so this is work that I've been doing together with some other people from Ericsson Research, so Mirja, Zahed, and Magnus. Um, so as you probably know, we have seen over the years an increased protection of end-to-end -end data. Um, we see that application data has increasingly, increasingly gotten protected using the HTTPS and uh, we are encrypting parts of the TLS as well, probably, hopefully soon. Uh, we see a lot of protection of connection state, things like, you know, that was previously openly available to the network, uh, like the state of connections, which packets are being sent and which are retransmitted and whatnot. So we have the QUIC and TLS, uh, we encrypt most of these headers and we see that we're in HTTP, we're moving from using TCP as a substrate to using QUIC. So uh, a lot of these kind of endpoint states are getting uh, encrypted. And then a lot more things, sort of all of these auxiliary services that we have in relation to our to our end-to-end uh, -end connections like DNS and such is also getting encrypted. So as an observer in the network uh, that used to look at a lot of these fields to, to build things and do things, uh, it kind of has a big impact, right, on on uh, on how how what techniques they need to use to to manage their networks, pretty much. Marcus, we don't see the slides in presentation mode, and we still see the first slide. So. Oh really? Oh. Yeah, that's um, working correctly. That's weird. Um, so it maybe was something when I went to full screen. Then. Um, you have to share it after you go to full screen. Ah, okay. Then I'll. Otherwise, uh, otherwise you share the wrong window. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'll try that then. Uh, so I'll stop sharing and then go back to put this one into full screen. And then we try again. PowerPoint slideshow. Is that better? It looks great. Okay, good. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, yeah, so I was talking to this slide and I guess this is stuff that uh, like most of you guys already know pretty well. So I can go on to talk a little bit about the stuff that mobile network operators have been doing and that they are doing and that they have traditionally been relying on kind of uh, available data in, in, in the metadata relating to connections or content itself uh, for a various set of use cases that have been either beneficial only to the operator, sometimes to both the operator and the user, depends on, <laughs> maybe depends a little bit on, on who you ask and when. But there, there's been a bunch of, of actions that, that, that uh, operators apply, and this is not a, an exhaustive list, but it's a list of common use cases that, that mobile operators do. Uh, some classic things is just pure access control of traffic. So it can be, you know, based on firewall rules and whatnot. Uh, typically this has been very straightforward to do. If you didn't have any level of encryption, you as vendors, we build a lot of ways to inspect the traffic and, and sort of let the operator define rules on what you do to pass and block it. With various levels of encryption, of course, some of those mechanisms do not become as straightforward as they were. Then there has been a bunch of maybe less uh, nice uh, use cases at times. Uh, one use case is, uh, is a redirection use case, which has usually been used by mobile operators when uh, a user is out of quota, uh, so they cannot access anymore. Typically what happens is that you either all internet access is dropped or you get very, very slow access. A bunch of operators, when things were completely uh, sort of uh, unencrypted and most traffic went over HTTP 1.1 was that they basically just intercepted HTTP requests and redirected users to some top-up site. So that was a very cheap and convenient way of, of sort of enabling, uh, enabling like helping the user top up their, their uh, data bucket if, if needed. And of course, that is something that completely doesn't work anymore because of encryption. Um, some other things that operators did was to sometimes uh, they had agreements with uh, 
with certain content providers and they could enrich some some content on on the on a http connection giving some information about the user's quota or something and that could help help the server decide if it should deliver you know large piece of content or something smaller and of course these things also do not work with encryption other things that are kind of more perhaps uh, in use today and perhaps more important are uh, um, parental control for instance a lot of mobile operators have uh, uh, <clears throat> mobile operators that have uh, regulatory requirements on them to be able to to provide parental control features to 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 their customers i think we had an example of that yesterday in the discussion that they they, they provide the, like a service to so so you can set up an, a subscription for your children and you can sort of have that subscription controlled of what you allow and not and of course these things work super easy if you don't have encryption depending on the level of encryption it becomes sort of more and more difficult like today you typically use a lot of dns information and and parse snis and things like that to to kind of do lookups in databases. Some often these are databases provided by uh, kind of regulatory entities to, to know if this is an application that fits the brand. Um, there's some noise in the background. We're just calling user to you can mute, please. Yeah, I'll continue. Um, uh, other um, important use cases for mobile operators where typically having awareness of the type of traffic is, is around charging. Um, and we have like two ways of doing charging of the data. We have something called online charging, which is typically happening on the fly. When, when the data is passing through the network, we, we, we look at what type of data it is, we count the bytes, and, and we, we apply the charging. And then we have something called offline charging, which is where we kind of do some post-processing of, of, of the data and and, uh, and then apply the charging. And that's because mobile operators often have, in, in certain markets, often have like different charging buckets depending on, on application types. And sometimes you have content that is zero rated. So uh, for instance, you have a set of applications that are accessed without uh, consuming bytes from your data bucket. Sometimes that is purely a commercial, um, a pure commercial thing. Like you have in some countries, you can you can watch video for free, but maybe that video is is delivered at a lower quality or something like that. But we also have cases where there's there's a regulatory requirement to zero rate certain services. So that could be services that have to do with um, all the all the services provided by an operator relating to your uh, subscription must be zero rated, and it could be other things like some critical services that need to be uh zero rated by by uh by a mobile operator um uh, <clears throat> yeah actually it's a good point from the from the chat there that there, there was an agreement to to zero rate covid 19 and uh, related uh, national health resources that was was a thing and not some countries also had to zero rate uh, um like online school platforms and things like this because people kids were were kind of uh, studying from home other important use cases is service-based quality of service. So you can you can apply these things to to uh, uh, you you can apply different quality of service to different applications. So you know we want some real-time critical thing. You might might want to have that one uh, in a different quality of service class than others. Uh, things like that. And then we've done things like transport protocol optimization. Like we put in TCP proxies there to to accelerate flows. Things like this. They want access to 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 bits on the wire. And all of these things, they, they kind of work, but they work more, work less clearly with uh, with the kind of encryption that, that we see. And depending on the level of encryption, it, it works more or less. Uh, other things is like just pure analytics. A lot of operators want to know what kind of traffic is going through, which applications are popular, how how much resources are they consuming in my network, and then they usually build in some kind of reporting functions as well. So if we see some spike in some specific application type that can that can trigger some event, just more for like yeah, business planning and stuff like that. And then we have all the things around fraud prevention and malware detection and these kind of things that typically also would like to inspect traffic. So this is a, just a set of use cases that operators are still considering very much, uh, have been considering and sort of are willing to invest quite a lot of money. Um, <clears throat> and then, um, yeah, and of course they all get a little bit challenged by encryption. 
And we see that the kind of encrypted uh, mechanisms and protection are, are kind of becoming uh, more and more advanced. And I think one of the more recent things we have seen, which is uh, a really great tool for improving end user privacy is, is this use of, um, of relays where you have multiple kind of proxies uh, that, that you deploy where, where you basically um, tunnel traffic from a client towards a server uh, between first through a first proxy, typically named an ingress proxy, through a, another tunnel through this egress proxy, and then finally have traffic reach the server. And the reason why, why we start to see these types of deployments is that you, you kind of uh, enhance, you, you reduce the amount of leakage of uh, information that, that uh, user um, from a user to, to different parts of the network. So for instance, the operator of an ingress proxy and, and the access network will know something about the user, can know the user's IP address, maybe know something about the subscription type of this user or whatnot. Um, but because we are tunneling traffic through this proxy, um, uh, through another proxy, you have this part of the communication where, where pretty much you don't know much about the user, um, but here the, the server or the service being accessed is now visible. So this part of the network now does not know anything about the service, uh, and this part does not know much about the user. So it, it's a new paradigm that we see it's being deployed, um, and it, of course, has, has even more implications on the current way of, of, uh, of doing things. Um, so if we just go back to this, uh, to this little table, we see that when we have this kind of relay set up, uh, a lot of these services become uh, pretty much difficult or on, impossible to do in the way we have done them before um, because we were pretty much relying on having uh, free access to, to fields that were intended for the end-to-end -end communication. Uh, so, uh, of course, something needs to be done if, if any or some of these uh, use cases are still to be uh, supported, we need to do we need to change the way we actually do them and try to make these things more collaborative. Uh, because one thing is clear is that all of these things have been done in a way that sort of, sort of did not include the user uh, particularly much. Um, so what we are proposing is that uh, these relay services that are used for enhanced privacy also can be used for kind of enhanced collaboration. So the idea is that uh, <clears throat> We change, uh, we change the way we do in-network functionality from being completely transparent to you know, looking at and mucking around with fields to actually having some more cooperative uh, solutions which involve the different entities in the network. Um, and we want to provide then collaborative and explicit network support functions, meaning that the, the, the consumers of these functions are aware of the existence of these functions and are aware of the and have somewhat to say if, if these functions are to be used or not. So the idea is that there is some sort of endpoint control and consensus. So a client, potentially even a server, could select proxies and functions based on these proxies. Um, we would ensure that there is um, <clears throat> tunneling of traffic such, such that all the end-to-end -end communication is, uh, is encrypted and not tampered with um, and cannot be tampered with. And the idea is then to use uh, Quick and HTTP3 as a substrate and a tunneling protocol to do this. And this is because we are we are kind of basing this or the ideas on this on on the work that's being done in the in the Mask working group, which is defining the way of proxying using uh, HTTP or HTTP3. And then some examples of how this could be used. Then, um, so if we take a few of these use cases that that we were looking at that probably have some mutual benefit, mutual benefit both to, to an operator and to, to an end user. Uh, we could look at them, like for instance, how could we do parental control in a way uh, that doesn't allow, doesn't mean we need to inspect all the packets? Um, can we do zero rating without knowing exactly which flow is carrying what application and stuff like that? Um, the way it has been done, as we saw on the list there, uh, it has pretty much been done that we configure a set of application identifiers in the network. Uh, and these application identifiers are translated into packet detection rules. And this is all according to the 3GPP uh, specifications. And these packet detection rules are then um, applied in the 
core network user plane of a mobile network. Uh, they have some deep packet inspection functions used to detect traffic. Often that is based on SNIs in the TLS handshakes, the IP ranges. Uh, it can also be correlating between like DNS traffic from a user and, and, and what it's later accessing, things like this. Um, but of course, uh, this is the stuff we want to get away from because it's not, it's not very good to do this and it's not really uh, foolproof either. So what we're looking at instead is that these services could be explicitly requested by user in some way. Um, and the idea is that, for instance, if a network operator hosts an ingress proxy, uh, it can then apply specific policies based on which uh, egress proxy the, the, the user is connecting to. So we might have might, might be aware of a set of egress proxies, uh, and each egress proxy might be associated with a particular service. And then as a mobile operator, we would apply a specific policy, for instance, differential charging or something based on whatever egress proxy the, the, the client has, has uh, selected. Um, then the ingress proxy can pretty much accept, reject, or reject the connection request towards different egress proxies based on the awareness of the subscription type of this user. So do I know that this user is a zero rate enabled user? Okay, if that's the case, then I will, I will allow this traffic to pass on to the egress proxy. And then finally, this egress proxy that does not know anything about the user or something maybe, but as little as possible, hopefully, uh, can pretty much accept or reject the traffic based on awareness of the target resource and awareness of the policy, but it doesn't know who the user is. So we kind of split up the concern a little bit. Um, maybe having some pictures on this simplifies a little bit. Um, so uh, in this case, the idea is that the policies, of course, are somehow defined by the mobile operator. So if you're using my network, you have access to these policies. Uh, a user equipment or a client device can, can fetch these policies from the mobile network operator, and then it can map these policies to, to, uh, to egress proxies, depending on the one type of treatment it wants. It, it sort of does this uh, relay connection through an ingress proxy to a specific egress proxy, specifying which policy uh, it needs. So in this case, say that we want to do zero rating, a client would, would uh, look at the mapping between, between which application it wants to connect to, which egress proxies are available, um, connect through the first proxy, indicating that it wants to, wants to uh, have connect through this particular egress proxy. Then the mobile network operator can look at the subscription type, understand that this is a user that is eligible for zero rating or not, and then allow or not allow this connection to the proxy. If it allows it, the second proxy would then look at, um, would then look at which service is this is trying to be accessed here, and is that in accordance with the policy that I'm supporting? And if that's the case, it allows things to go through. So we have now removed the, the need to, to sort of inspect every packet and trying to infer from packets kind of what application this is uh, to something more kind of collaborative where a user decides to, to kind of use a specific service knowing that it do, does give up a bit bit of information to the mobile network operator, because now the operator knows, to the very least, it knows which category of traffic this belongs to. And you sort of, and you would know that, okay, if this is something that goes through, it's part of the bucket of traffic that I zero rate, so I know something about this traffic. But I don't know, for instance, if this is a YouTube flow, a Netflix flow, or whatever. So you, you, you have, you preserve a lot more privacy than you did with uh, exposing fields. So that's, that's one way we're looking at doing collaboration. And so if we just go to the takeaways here, um, the point that we're trying to make is that uh, we think that moving towards a model where you don't just inspect fields uh, that, are, that are there for you for free, but actually doing something more explicit, you, you get a much more secure way of doing it. You, you share the right data with the right entity. You don't rely on fields that are you know, flying around on the network. Uh, you get explicit trust relations that provide the basis for more targeted information exchanges. So, so you only exchange the information that you actually need. You don't need to bleed more information than that. Um, <clears throat> using relays, we can enable explicit collaboration. Uh, 
you have the real in the network. We avoid protocol ossification because we don't look at fields. We also remove the ambiguity of the information because we explicitly share information that is intended for resources. We don't, we don't look at traffic and try to infer what's going on. Um, and hopefully we're turning a challenge that the mobile network operators see today with encryption in, into some kind of opportunity that, where we actually can increase the collaboration between uh, users and networks and, and at the same time improve the user privacy. So, um, yeah, this is pretty much what I wanted to, to say here. Thank you, Marcus. We have a queue building. Um, we're also a little over time. That's all right. I think the first person in the queue is actually all the way up, uh, Patrick. Go ahead. Yeah, hi there. Uh, thank you, Marcus. Uh, I suppose really I've got a couple of uh, questions, struck observations. Would you be able to, uh, it would appear that someone passively observing the choice of uh, final egress proxy would be able to build some kind of picture as to the likely state of the subscriber behind that. Uh, and secondly, um, what would be the effect uh, that a mobile user would have when they're, for example, roaming uh, away on a, on a guest network? And finally, I guess really it kind of strikes me that um, whilst uh, fixed ISP networks and mobile network operators are um, subject to regulation, it would it would appear that likelihood that uh, egress proxy operators would be subject to some form of regulation, you know, such as stuff as uh, court mandated blocking yeah yeah for sure the, there is the, there's definitely a lot of regulation on mobile network operators i think it will be very interesting to see uh what the regulatory requirements will be on these type of providers i think normally uh yeah the regulations are there because normally the mnos are seen as the infrastructure providers so so yeah that, that, that's a super interesting question and and what how will this relate to things like uh, lawful intercept and other things I think is, is something that 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 needs to be thought about a lot uh, going forward. I don't have a great answer to to how it will look now because yeah it's regulatory <laughs> it's, it's difficult. Um, whether you can um, sort of build a model of the behavior of a user by observing which egress proxies it's connecting to I think that that, that that's an interesting one and I think that largely depends on how you do it with the addressing of the egress proxies and how you basically expose to the ingress proxy, which egress proxy you use and, and, and what kind of policy it's related to. And I think you could, that could be an issue, but I think you could probably build that away as well, if, 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 you, if you think a bit about it. And uh, um, uh, it's not something I've put a very much thought into, but I think it's, it's, it's an interesting point to, to, to consider, I think. Uh, and then finally, you had a question on roaming users. How would this work for roaming users? So I think it doesn't have much of an impact. Roaming doesn't have that much of an impact depending on how you do the roaming. But usually you would, uh, when you do roaming, uh, you basically your all your traffic gets tunneled to your home core network. The home. So if you're if you're in the UK and you w visit Sweden, all your internet traffic would go go through your packet gateway in the UK. And in this case, uh, because you're connected to your to your home core, I guess you would also be able to connect to 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 the ingress proxy of your home core. I I don't think we would start like providing proxy services from like visited networks, um, but that, that that in itself is perhaps something interesting to think about. But I, I, in general, I think it, roaming would work like today. You, you you access your home core network and have your own home core network services. Go ahead, Richard. You're next in the queue. Um, yeah, so I, I think this is like overall a sensible architecture. In, in my mind, I've been imagining that like the, the future equilibrium state of this relaying stuff probably ends up looking like, you know, having an ingress relay associated to the origin AS of a flow and an egress relay associated to the uh, destination AS. And so you kind of get that level of granularity on the internet. Um, I wonder whether, you know, egress level policy is really going to get you that far. Far. Um, you know, for example, zero rating might be um, you know, very, you know, you might have zero rating policies that are quite granular if you want, you know, topic specified to COVID-19 stuff. And so, you know, if, if you're, if you think about an egress as indicating, you know, what CDN you're using or what destination AS you're headed to, that might not be a granular level of, um, granular mm -hmm. enough uh, level of information. But, but I think, you know, if, if we take this logic a step further, like there's already 
uh, been some discussion of, of um, you know, kind of interactions, collaboration, one might say, between ingress and egress proxies. Um, already, I think in the private relay system, you mentioned there is some uh, interaction between those, mainly for authorization purposes, demonstrating authority to use the whole system. Um, and uh, there's been some discussion around in in the orbit of the uh, IETF Oblivious HTTP working group of, of like having some communications around abuse, so that you could you could back propagate abuse signals from the egress to the ingress, so the ingress could quash abuse of stuff. Um, I think you could envision some more, you know, enriching that interaction to cover things other types of policy than abuse. Yeah. Um, but I think the tricky thing would be to make sure that that gets structured in a way that you only reveal, um, you know, enough information to accomplish the job. And you know, you, so you don't undo the benefits you've gotten by the, the proxy. Exactly. I, I think that that's, that's an extremely good point. And I, actually, we, we have been thinking of, you know, along these lines and I didn't put it in here because, you know, a lot of levels of detail. But one thing we're looking at is, for instance, using, uh, using tokens from privacy pass. Um, so basically, um, the the mobile network operator, not just while it's not just, um, uh, let's say, while it's not just maybe, you know, providing like identifiers of the mapping between uh, egress proxies and policies, you might also provide uh, tokens associated with specific policies. And for instance, you might have various fine grain type of zero rating, like you said, uh, but we might know that this proxy does all types of zero rating. We don't, we don't really care, but if the client can provide a token to this to this egress proxy that is validated, you know, it's attested by 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 this by this mobile network operator that this is the particular policy that that I'm allowed to use. Then this egress proxy could could enforce specific access control based on that policy if the if the egress proxy is aware of it. So that something along along these lines is what, what we're thinking on. Of, of course, and it needs to be uh, well thought through and if, if, if it covers all of these issues, but that, that, that's, that, that's one way we're, we're looking at it at least. Yeah. Great. Um, I had, I put myself in the queue and, um, and then there's just one other person left after me, but I, I guess I was thinking that um, it is, it, you demonstrate really well what others um, I think have, have talked about, which is that once you sort of start introducing lots of encryption, um, management or network management is then forced to be even more intrusive, perhaps with its methods, like you mentioned, deep packet inspection, for example. Um, yeah. And so obviously that trade off is is real. Um, and then you're sort of offering then um, a way of, of opt in or some meaningful um, action on the part of the users where they are, are aligned with the services they're receiving. And so you will be able to provide those without being so intrusive. But then I wonder about the users then that sort of don't opt for anything if their traffic will either just have um, fewer of these features or if they will sort of continue to be um, subjected to more sort of intrusive, um, I guess, I don't want to use the word surveillance because that's not what you're doing, but you're detecting, I guess, in a more intrusive way. And, and whether it, it there are now sort of like three categories of users, those who've opted in, those who have um, explicitly not opted in, and then, you know, the, those... Um, that are sort of still, I guess, having these these techniques all at the same time sort of used on their traffic. It might be interesting to um, detangle those different categories rather than just having two binary ones. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That, that, I think that's an excellent point. And I, I think that will really um, boil down to the type of use case. I mean, if we're looking at some of these things like, okay, you, we want to enable to do zero rating. I think very few operators would do zero rating on something that is so fuzzy as, you know, uh, imagine deep packet inspection after all the SNI fields and everything are encrypted. Um, you resort to, to some of the techniques we saw yesterday with machine learning and whatnot. And that doesn't give you nearly enough of the precision that's required to do things related to charging, I think. So, but then of course you might have other use cases like, yeah, I want to protect you against malicious sites or something. And that might, for sure, you know, okay, you're not opting into using this, so maybe, yeah, we will apply our machine learning to this. And uh, I would hope not, but that, that's definitely potentially uh, something that would happen. Yeah. Well, it feels like in the case of zero rating, right, you, your user would be motivated because they would be getting mm -hmm. something for free if they don't opt in, but they could still potentially choose not to, right? That might be- Of course, of course. And then, and then yeah. and in that case, I don't think that their traffic would be, you know, inspected to to say, ah, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to push you to zero, you know, I'm going to take yeah. what I'm going to zero rate. But, um, yeah, from use case to use case, definitely. And there, there could be cases where, where 
uses that don't opt in, they will get yeah Great. more analyzed potentially. Thanks. So one more um, question, and we'll move on. Um, Torlas. So thanks a lot. Um, if if this is going to be in any form of draft or other place in the IETF in London or so, would be very happy to continue the discussion there on that. Um, I, I question, you know, the the relevance of of kind of the proxy functions insofar as pinholing traffic through actual, you know, devices that otherwise wouldn't need it, because in the end, what you're showing in the picture is in the first place some policy plane um, and some enforcement plane, and we already have a lot of these models for that. Um, and uh, so, I think one of the questions to put against these models is to show how they explicitly would differ and uh, compare to such pre-existing models, such as PCP, for example, right? Sure, uh, security-wise, encryption-wise or so, these older models from 10 years ago may not live up to snuff, but a lot of the other aspects that we've done back then um, would certainly, I think, still be quite valuable. So it's mm. not as if we are coming out of uh, greenfield on solutions like this, but uh, have been through a couple of, um, you know, iterations, and so it would certainly be good not to repeat mistakes or redo things that were already done wrong correctly. Yeah. I think that that's an excellent point, and I think, uh, I mean, may, the main reason why why we're looking at new things is, is because we want to. We already have this relay setup, and it provides a lot of additional privacy for users. And this is sort of making use of this setup that that provides additional security and privacy, and then enabling some of these more. Uh, Policy related uh, uses as well within that architecture, but I think it's it's a very good point that you know, we should we shouldn't be keep reinventing the wheel and and redoing old mistakes. So so yeah. Sure. Well, I mean, I'm obviously coming more from from the side of uh, on the high speed end, right? And I'm always worried about solutions that unnecessarily pinhole traffic through devices yeah. that then become a bottleneck. Um, mm -hmm. if, if from the beginning we'd start doing something that uh, is meant to work with the highest speed networks, then we're also prepared for, you know, beyond 5G. Yeah, for sure, for sure. That's a good point. And I mean, if you, if, you, if you look at this, at least the ingress proxy is, the idea that we're proposing is that you co-locate that with the, the user plane function in 5G. And the user plane function is really the, the kind of gateway you have between internet traffic and mobile network or access network traffic, pretty much. So so all traffic is, is going through here anyway. We just have to make sure that the, the proxy is performant enough, right? But, uh, but yeah, it's it's a very good point. Yes. Right. Yeah, and I think the same is true for the egress um, side. You want to place this at some place uh, in front of your data center where you anyway kind of aggregate some kind of traffic. So you don't want to necessarily reroute the traffic or create new bottlenecks there or whatever. Thanks very much, Marcus. Appreciate your presentation. Um, while we're getting ready to transition to Michael's final presentation of the day, I just wanted to please ask um, if you're calling in, call in user two, if you could just tell us who you are. Call in user two, are you on the phone? So, uh, this, so this, is, this is Jahed. I don't know if I'm calling user two or something, but I had to connect uh, via this, uh, uh, phone bridge because my work phone will not allow the WebEx link to be copied and pasted on the application. So, sorry about that, but this is Jayad <laughs> calling in. No, it's perfectly fine to call in. We just need to know who you are. And um, yeah, you're the only one on the phone as far as I can tell. So, it must be you. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Uh, Michael, go ahead and uh, queue up yourself. If you need help, let me know. I'm, I'm happy to drive if you, if you prefer. Um, I'll try going to presentation mode before and then sharing and see what happens. <laughs> uh, I guess is that it? Probably is. Okay. Yeah. It's looking looks good. Like, looks yeah. like it might work. So it seems like uh, we are convinced, or I was convinced that. We'll just change our, we'll change our, our, our stateless stuff yet again um, for that, and we'll change it to actually be co-op. Toilas, can you uh, mute your microphone? Make it stateful. Very much like RFC 9031. Um, yeah, good idea. Good RFC. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Thanks. What the hell? <laughs> 
Okay, am I supposed to begin? <laughs> yes, you can go now. We're all we're all quiet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, this is the sidecar. The sidecar is this uh, idea that came up in conversations with uh, Keith and I. And um, we now have a paper accepted in Hotnets with uh, Gina, David, Matthew, uh, students from Stanford. And um, some of you may have heard that story before in a slightly different way, but essentially the same thing really uh, in the path of a networking research group in the Vienna ITF where I once presented it. Um, I'll go ahead if I can. Yes. <laughs> so uh, this is specifically, uh, I mean, Marcus before had these various functions of, of um, proxies on one of his slides and uh, there was only one line dedicated to transport functions for performance improvement and uh, this is really specifically that line that, that I'm talking about. Uh, that's that's all I'm doing here, all I'm proposing it to, to do something about. Uh, the problem for that is that <clears throat> we have encrypted transport headers with product with, with Quick, which uh, can have benefits and it solves the ossification problem for sure, but it comes at a cost. There are now a couple of papers that show that um, with PEPs, TCP can be faster than quick, for example, in a satellite scenario, but there can be other scenarios. I'm expecting similar things with millimeter wave connections and so forth, where these devices that try to help and sometimes do weird, wrong, bad things, but sometimes also do good things, at least try their best, <laughs> uh, turn out to actually help and make things better for quick. And then we have what I would call a dilemma that the protocol is called quick and before was called speedy, but it's really slower. Um, so it's known that PEPs can be bad. This is a picture of a connection splitter, right? Very uh, intrusive, it terminates a TCP connection, opens another one. Um, they try to be useful, but you know, this, this bad interference can cause ossification and uh, this is at least partially due to the transparent design of these devices. Basically they lie to the sender and the receiver because they're not meant to even participate in the, in the whole communication, so they, they cheat. And uh, this cheating has certainly contributed to the ossification itself. So uh, not making pro proxies transparent can be a way to not be uh, as prone <clears throat> to ossification as we previously were. Mask is a system that is not transparent, um, so possibly it might be a way to improve uh, performance by adding PEP functionalities there. Uh, actually, this whole thing here started from the assumption that essentially the people doing mask might not be very happy with this partially because they might believe, so I, I, I don't want to vote to be in one or the other camp, I don't really know, but there might be a belief that this could cause ossification problems again. You retrofit some uh, performance improving function into, in, into mask and all of a sudden mask is forever tied to that function. Now, I don't know, this could be a good or it could be a bad model, it could be more efficient than what we're proposing here, but if as we believe <laughs> the people doing these protocols are not very happy with the idea of adding uh, performance improving functionalities to them, to these, uh, to, to mask for example, then this is a way around it. Okay, so the idea is separation of concerns to completely keep the whole uh, uh, performance improving function separate as good as possible, as far as possible. Uh, so there would be a, side, a separate sidecar, it's a separate protocol, independent of the main protocol, um, just dealing with the PEP functions as, as moving as much as possible as the functionality of the functionality to it. The main protocol, normally being quick, uh, would choose the service as, as an opt-in over a local interface. So you could imagine a daemon on the OS, you could imagine a library function, something that you use to call and over which you say, okay, this particular performance improving function, I choose for that particular connection, right? So depending on, I mean, these functions also come with a security trade-off. You may share certain information that you might not really want to share in some cases. So for a banking application, you may choose to never use any of these functions. 
It really depends. So you can do it per connection. The application can make a decision to say, okay, it's something that I'm okay with. And um, then the main protocol should be changed as little as possible, at least that was our design idea. So there wouldn't be any connection splitting and the, the sidecar proxy <clears throat> does not pass the header. Uh, we don't change anything about encrypt encrypting. Everything stays encrypted. Um, what you need in order to do any kind of reasonable PEP-like function is normally to send X for most cases. Uh, sometimes you can just cache something and resend it, but often you need to send X. Uh, so that is what we really looked at. X could be sent in various ways. They could be sent out of band, but they could also be piggybacked, for instance, using UDP options. And uh, then if we have that thing in place, then if the sidecar itself ossifies, then this means that the PEP function doesn't improve any further, which is kind of sad, right? We may have something that makes better congestion control and it doesn't improve because it has been ossified, but this is harmless. It will never really harm the main protocol. It will just be a performance improvement that doesn't work so well, work as, as good as it might in the future. So the PEP functions are use cases then <clears throat> of uh, the sidecar, or we call them sidecar protocols. And I'll come to three examples to explain the principle. One example is congestion control division. Um, that's about getting data to the proxy early, where we might want to have it in case we have, for instance, a fluctuating capacity wireless link, like a millimeter wave link where capacity drops capacity becomes available and we want to be able to immediately send out data. Um, rather than telling the sender that it should now immediately react and send us something which may lead to the data coming to the proxy or to this middle device too late, we want to be able to say give us data earlier, just like a TCP connection, split, connection splitter could. Um, and well, the service choice then means that uh, clearly, for sending more data earlier because of X from the proxy, um, the quick server would have to agree that if this uh, sidecar entity, this local entity, tells it that it should increase its congestion window further, then it will do that. Now, you may be okay with that or you may not, right? But if, <laughs> if that is the kind of service that is being offered, if you want to choose it, that is, that's the deal. You, you trust the system to uh, tell you to increase your window and that this is on the basis of something reasonable. And the notification would then be from this sidecar, proc uh, sidecar entity that the NAC has arrived and uh, the window should be increased and more data should be sent. And then on the way from the proxy to the client, uh, congestion control really becomes just a matter of influencing the drain rate of a queue on the basis of X from uh, the client side as well. This could be, uh, couldn't really be done with monitoring X in case of quick so easily, but uh, a sidecar could be placed there and also send X. Um, but at least the main protocol wouldn't have to be involved on the client side for this particular use case. You just need to do something on the server side. Uh, and you'd have to, to have, you'd have to have the entity running. Now, another example is ACK reduction. <clears throat> um, that's something very different. Uh, there is a paper from these colleagues in, in uh, Trento University who came up with a proxy idea where simply, <clears throat> well, the basic idea here is that every time a Wi-Fi connected user equipment sends an ACK, it really sends two ACKs because it sends a transport layer ACK and a link layer ACK. In fact, then, you know, even even this, this transport layer act is probably being acted at the link layer, so that makes three. But uh, instead of having these double acts, the idea here is that uh, a, TCP con a, a TCP proxy could look at the data and it would just cache the packet when it sends it on to the, to the user equipment and then the user equipment wouldn't have to send any acts, but uh, instead the proxy would wait for a link layer act so the link layer act would happen, but not a transport layer act. And upon the link layer act, the proxy could just construct the act that the client would normally be meant to send. And so then you don't need any client acts uh, at the transport layer. This, of course, can only work for basic positive acts for the cumulative ones, uh, not when you add some options, not for two packs and so forth. 
Now with Quick, uh, the way we could implement this will be to have this service choice to say that, okay, I will accept the X from the from the proxy. I will treat them like the client X, but I will still keep the data in the send buffer just in case, so that uh, some, well, for the sake of reliability, we don't we don't ruin things. <laughs> And uh, the sidecar notification would be that an ACK has arrived. So that would mean that the client uh, doesn't have to ACK as much. Uh, the server would, in this case, have to involve the client in the main protocol, so in Quick. Uh, I think there is a fun I forgot, I forgot what it's called, but there is something I found where the server can tell the client to send less X or to control the rate of the X. So that would be could be used to make the client send fewer X because the proxy would already act on its behalf. And then you have less collisions on the wireless segment. And third um, would be basically loops, a very simple use case, sorry, where the server and the client aren't really involved and you would just have a receiver side proxy knowing about the sender side proxy and the receiver side proxy will just send X to the sender side proxy to retransmit uh, lost packets to identify them and locally retransmit them. Now, uh, the hacking is one of the key things here. Um, there are several ways to do it. Uh, one is uh, like in this lightweight PEP um, <clears throat> uh, paper from uh, some of the colleagues in Ericsson and some of the colleagues in Hungary. <laughs> Sorry for forgetting all the names of whoever was involved, a couple of people here. Uh, but the lightweight uh, lightweight PEP, I think it also just did a ha did a, did a did a hash over the packets. Now that is one way one way to that that's possible. But that means that you would have the sidecar or whatever kind of proxy you have. You would you would require it to hash everything, or to hack every packet. And um, we were considering this 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 problem of uh, trying to well reduce the number of X a little bit and have cumulative X like with uh, you know in TCP you have a sequence number that's growing, and you can just easily make a cumulative X. But um, when everything is encrypted, you can't. You don't have anything that you know is clearly growing all the time. So uh, another possibility will be to hash over a number of packets. Just take some bytes out of the header or a certain offset from here to there. Take a hash over a number of packets, a beginning hash and end hash, and say that, okay, this this reflects a total of ten packets. The problem with this idea is that um, to identify which packet precisely was was dropped, the sender would have to well try quite a number of different uh, different hashes, right? All the possible subsets of uh, ten packets or less, in the example I just gave. So our solution is what we call quacks. I was the only one saying this name is too ridiculous, but we ended up with quacks. <laughs> um, now in quacks, uh, everything is based on power sums. <clears throat> Here, the idea is that uh, well, there is there is some math that uh, our the students understand, and probably Keith understands. I can't claim to fully understand it, but the intuition is pretty easy. Basically, if I uh, if if I send you the numbers one, three, five, ten, they're all different numbers, and I say one of the numbers might be missing, up to one or zero or up to one, then um, then uh, well, if I send you the the sum, then looking at the sum, you know precisely which packet is missing, right? What did I say? Ten, five, three, one. So that would be uh, nineteen. If I send you, let's say, 14, uh, you know, you, you know that the packet number five is missing. So it's as easy as that. In case of up to one missing packet, now um, if we, well, there is maths that proves that this can be generalized to up to n missing uh, missing uh, numbers. Sorry, I touched something. Uh, by using up to n power sums. So basically, instead of sending in my example, uh, 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 10, I would also send 1 square plus 3 square plus 5 square plus 10 square. And for instance, 1 to the power of 3, 3 to the power of 3, 5 to the power of 3, 10 to the power of 3. And then we could guarantee that up to three missing packets, you will be able to identify which they were, just out of, I mean, from the numbers. 
So in that case, it's a matter of taking a couple of numbers from the header that uh, we can assume to be large enough to be uh, most likely different and using them to construct these sums and sending back, sending them back. And uh, the, you know, uh, some simulations were done and some calculations to figure out that the straw man, for example, straw man two, uh, the decoding time can be unbelievably large in the case of, in this case, we have thousand packets, right? Because you have to do all the hashes of up to thousand possible cases or up to 20 lost 20 out of up to 20 out of thousand. So many combinations, 16 bits to store the count. And uh, well, anyway, you see that power sums work really well for this. It's one way to do it. Um, Altogether, we believe this is a viable way to uh, solve this dilemma. And uh, there is research needed. We've, we've only just begun. We have this first paper which, which looks at the quarks in detail. Uh, but there are some parameters here over what, what range and how often will we send quarks. Uh, how is an, a sidecar proxy discovered? Would we just use a model like Marcus has presented, for example, with an uh, ingress and an egress proxy? Could be like that. I mean, could be various ways to do it. How many sidecars should there be on the path? For example, when there is only one sidecar, things get a whole lot easier when there are multiple. You know, there are cases that make this, uh, I mean, things, things do get more complicated. For example, in the use case of uh, congestion control division that I said, I just talked about increasing the window, but truly it's not just increasing the window that will have to change on the sender side, but also, you know, the sender would have to maintain a sort of credit such that when the client acts, it doesn't also increase the window for the client acts. Now, if there are multiple sidecars each acting, you know, things become more complicated. So we, we need to make sure that, is, that we don't have a string of sidecars all acting back to the sender. Uh, there should be some management, there are, there are some multipath considerations, some issues related to trust and privacy. So uh, some of these problems could be per sidecar protocol, some are general, but um, there, I, I believe, I believe there was some sort of consensus actually when I presented that uh, path and at path of our networking um, that these things are solvable. So there are problems, there are issues, but it's not like completely road blocking. And I believe that's all I have to say. So I'd be curious to hear if people think that this is a way forward. This is what we should be doing. I don't know. We stop sharing. Thanks, Michael. Um, and so, yeah, we can definitely take questions. Please put yourself in the queue. Also, um, you mentioned that you've been presenting this work at Pathware Networking um, Research Group. Can you tell us more about that ongoing work or if there is a draft or anything? Uh, the ongoing work was that the first thing was that we presented this after discussing and the second was that we worked on the Hotnets paper. Okay. <laughs> and that's as, as up to date as it gets. Got it. And that presentation was at the last meeting or? Uh, no, that was the Vienna ITF. Oh, okay. Oh, nice. Hot, Hotnet okay. is just ahead. That's in November. All right. Um, Marcus? All right. Uh, I was just looking at your list of problems, and I thought there might be one more thing you want to add there, and this is how this relates to, to ECN and ECN feedback. So you had two models, right? One was where you get acts both from the client, and then you have this generated acts. And then I suppose that you don't need to relay kind of ECN responses in your uh, proxy acts, but the, the receiver uh, needs to figure out what to do if, if, if it sees some ECN reflection from the client and then it also sees acts from the, from the, from the proxy, right? So that, that's one thing. And then you had another model where, where you kind of generate acts on behalf of the client. And there, I think it, it's, it's also a little bit interesting. How would you then reflect the, if, if you see ECN coming down on the path or you would yourself want to do uh, CE marking. How would you? How would you sort of reflect that? I think that's something you need to consider in this model as well. Yeah, I simply agree. I mean, the the back off of congestion control needs to be a bit sophisticated, considering two uh, two sources or even multiple. The increase is a is a simpler case to talk about, right? That you you can increase faster to get data to the proxy, but indeed. Uh, when you have multiple multiple acts from multiple destinations, you need to do something more intelligent. I agree.
Great. Um, I think, um, Colin, you're next in the queue. I, so this is sort of more of an architectural question on this. I mean, I, I get what you're proposing here, and it's it's like, it, you know, this is amazing acts of tweaking things in magical ways to get this whole thing to work. It's not easy, okay. But it does make me wonder is, you know, what are the alternative approaches to this to, to achieve the same type of performance over satellites? I totally get the need for that. Um, but, you know, I was even thinking of things like the pre previous presentation we just saw on the relays. If you replace the, the PEP functions here with a relay, you, you get effectively the, the same things, but maybe some other properties. But what are the, the other ways that you could hit this problem? And I, I know you probably selected this way because you think it's best, but it would be interesting to understand what the alternatives look like. So we selected this way because we believe that probably the conversation that is about let's now try and add uh, add performance oriented functions into quick into quick in some way or add it to mask will be too difficult. <laughs> Right. So technically, I believe if you're willing to retrofit anything directly into Quick, you end up with something that technically works best at the expense of various things, right? I mean, and 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 also even more white hair. That's that's pretty much it. It is a workaround. Yeah. Okay. Fair. Okay. I think uh, Tommy, you're next in the queue. Um, thank you for presenting this. Um, with the particular use case you have here of like how you're going to transmit the quacks, like I, I, you know, I don't know about that. I need to like spend more time to really understand that and think about it. But you know, zooming out, um, I mean, essentially, what I'm hearing is that you're saying that you know we have we can have encrypted control channels to network operated boxes, you know, things on path like these proxies. And it, that gives the opportunity to have richer signals than just like ECN trying to flip like two bits in the IP headers. Like we can do path optimization signaling because we have a, a, a richer thing. And that I really like. Um, and I think that makes a lot of sense I mean, as someone working on mask stuff. Um, you know, we definitely have a lot of security privacy angles too, but I often also refer to masks, mask proxies as a NAT with a quick handshake on it. Like it's a, it's a NAT with a control channel or it's a PEP with that you're aware of with a control channel. So it gives you these opportunities. Um, and yesterday in some of the discussion, one of the things I had brought up was, you know, when we're trying to optimize things on the network, why do we need to like, sniff or categorize the content, you know, if you're trying to improve latency, just use ECN, just use L4S. And I guess one of the answers to maybe why that's not done all the time is maybe you need a bit more data than those bits have, or you can't rely on those bits not being cleared by other things because they're not authenticated and they're not encrypted. Um, so I think this is an interesting angle to say, you know, if we have more trust relationships to things on the path, that allows us to put more information or rely on the information a little bit more than we would for just the one or two bits that get twiddled. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you brought in other things, I think. You, uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm not sure it's, uh, <laughs> I don't know what to say. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure we're talking about the same thing really even. I mean, I agree more bits are good. I agree we can do better congestion control with um, having more fine grained information. I'm not sure this is what the sidecar would be the vehicle. I mean, or, it could be the vehicle that you use. Or, or rather, that, like it's, but... it's a model that we could imitate. Yeah. Maybe let me add something because I anyone anyway, wanted to say this and it just fits. Um, so, uh, you know, the one thing is the kind of information you want to provide and what you want to achieve. And there are different ways to provide this information and you can do it based on explicit trust and then you can even provide richer information and so on. What I like about this proposal is really this idea to like opportunistically send information to the server and either the server um, understands the information. I mean, it might not even speak the protocol, right? So it would be just like ignoring the information entirely, or it also can decide to actively not use this information. Uh, and so this is just another addition that is pretty nice here, I think. So it's just like a different kind of signaling channel, which is however limited to only providing a very certain kind of signals, which you can easily ignore or where you don't need a lot of trust. 
Yeah, I, f I forgot to say that um, in my presentation that, that a, a part of, I mean, a, probably a big part of what, we're, what what this is, is also to be independent of the protocol such that it would work in the same way for TCP as well. You know, now we have only these very ugly ways of doing things with TCP, but this will give one unique way or that, that would work for quick for TCP for everything in the same way. So I think that makes it a nice add-on. Uh, Miriam, did you want to jump in? I mean, you were just, yeah. So I think, um, sorry, I was trying to deal with the slide situation. <laughs> um, I think that this may be the end of the queue for this particular talk, but I would just invite everybody back to um, the larger discussion, maybe taking a wider view on the whole day um, and this topic of collaboration. I think there's some interesting themes, but the, the talks were all quite different. So I think I've seen folks in the um, in the chat who've not come on mic yet who wanted to talk were Nalini, uh, Dhruv, uh, Srinivas, if you wanted to just yeah hop in the conversation or others, if you want to join the queue, we can still use the plus queue um, convention. Go ahead, Nalini, yeah. Okay, thanks. You know, okay, so a couple of one kind of overarching point, I think, is that um, at enterprises, uh, you know, private managed networks have these needs as well. And some of them are the same as what's been talked about, and some of them are different. Um, and so, so I've been trying to keep that in mind all along. And And the other thing really is like, you know, I can't help but think about implementation challenges. I mean, how do we actually get this out? And there's been a little bit of discussion um, uh, on the on the chat. I mean, we're not coming from a greenfield implementation for sure. You know, and so and 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 so maybe it is that you have to put a another box in um, because the the task of changing applications to collaborate i mean it just it just seems like an impossible task and even even os's you know if you're talking about okay so you have the handful microsoft linux you know the the, the known suspects even getting them to move is a it's just a tremendous task and so I guess we went about it a completely different way, which is to to have it do it at the IP layer and do it externally. Um, and I really like the thing yesterday about um, uh, uh, you know the the P4 to changes the intelligent NIC or the smart um, switch kind of thing. I guess what I'm just I'm just thinking about how do we how do we make this work? That it's just a conversation. I just wanted to reflect um, similarly on the question that um, Richard sort of started us off on about um, why do people collaborate? I feel like it, by the end of your presentation and also with the comments, we were almost arriving at the question, why don't people collaborate <laughs> as it being a very primary consideration? Um, why wouldn't users um, want um, to share or to collaborate? And, and I thought that was um, maybe kind of the opposite, I think, of what Nalini you're worried about. Yeah. No, sure. I mean, there's there's privacy. I guess I'm just I'm coming from the point of view of like you know regulated industries, where there's you know we've we have to, or the military, you know, I mean I mean yes, <laughs> we're we're we have to monitor. There's just you know, and I'm sure everyone wants us to do, to do that too. 
<laughs> yeah, Tommy, you're in the queue. Go ahead. Um, so, so commenting, I, I think both on what you, Mallory, and Nalini were saying, um, th there was a thought I was having, and Richard was speaking earlier, uh, and there was kind of the questions that were brought up about, well, how would you trust uh, these devices? Like, how would the networks of devices trust each other to, enough to do the collaboration? Um, and Richard was alluding to this already, but I just kind of wanted to reiterate that I think different networks are going to have different requirements for the level of trust that they have in devices or vice versa. Um, yesterday, uh, in our discussion, uh, Jason was bringing up some like the Comcast parental controls use cases. And that's a case where, you know, this is a home network. I enable this feature to make sure that my devices or my kids' devices aren't going to sites I don't want them to go to. Um, or maybe you have a cafe network that's trying to uphold its terms and conditions about what you're supposed to get to. And I, I think it's useful to talk about those in a different category from like the super lockdown enterprise military network that has some, you know, really strong security uh, requirements. Um, and I, I think when we look at these home and public networks, I, at least how they operate today, they don't seem to want to entirely prevent users from being able to ever evade the blocks or uh, get around the optimizations. Like these networks usually allow you to use a VPN. They allow you to do a lot of things that uh, would allow you to bypass the checks, but they want to have the default OS and browser configurations do the filtering or get the optimizations they want such that, you know, someone who's not really hacking around or trying to mess around with things gets the right behavior by default. Um, and so for those cases, you know, the, the bar for what it means to collaborate may be easier to do. And so we, we could potentially apply this to more things. And then in the enterprise network case or the military network case, et cetera, at least, you know, in our experience of uh, trying to build, you know, like an iPhone that's going to get onto enterprise network, you have many more opportunities to have explicit certificate trust relationships about how things are being provisioned. And hopefully that will allow you to bootstrap more explicit trust as well, or um, even, you know, validation of about what's the stance of a device getting onto a network. So I'd be curious to hear what people think of, you know, how, how solvable are the different problems for the different uh, use cases in these networks. Um, Wes, you're in the queue. Uh, thanks. I mean, actually following a little bit up on what Tommy was talking about too, I, I really like where this discussion is going. I think, um, you know, both yesterday's set of presentations and today's you know, you know, both, both highlights the problem space really well, as well as, you know, provides us some direction of maybe there's hope. But I will say before the start of this workshop, I was not sure that there was hope and I, and I have some hope coming out of it. Um, but I do have other concerns, but in particular, privacy protocols have always been designed to auto protect the user, right? You use HTTPS, you get security and, you know, there's no sniffing. The whole point of TLS 1.3 and encrypted SNIs is to provide more of that. The whole point of encrypted DNS is to protect the user where they don't have to think about it. And I worry about, you know, anytime you present some of these options to users of, we want you to leak a little bit of information so that we can prioritize you or give you better services. I worry about user presentation so that they can make intelligent opt-in choices especially in, in situations where there's a lot of commercial deception. You know, everybody wants a social media account on platform X, but they really don't understand the ramifications of, of signing up and what sort of level of tracking, you know, that, that comes into play. So we have to be careful here in terms of, you know, forward thinking, I'm thinking, you know, 10 years down the line of where are we going to end up with this? And, um, you know, are we going to be right back where we started with without much privacy because we've put in too many holes or, you know, because the users don't understand them? Um, I, I think that the 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 whole point of opt in in order to get better transmission paths and things like that is absolutely fantastic. I worry that uh, nefarious organizations will tie it to um, tie features to things in order so that they can get back some of what they've lost in the past you know decade.
Yeah, there's nobody left in the queue, but there is discussion of what Wes just brought up. Um, oh, Nalini, go ahead. Um, but yeah, also we're kind of in the space too where I think folks can feel free to um, jump in. Like we don't have to have really strict queue management anymore. Thanks. So, so I think one of the things that I've kind of noticed, um, you know, at the ITF and, you know, writ large and then over time is that um, people don't, people have bad motives. I mean, and we just need to understand that. And so, I mean, I think trying to say that people are not going to do stuff because they can make money at it, they will. If they can figure out a way to make money and then and lie to people, that's what they're going to do. And so we need to design protocols, knowing that there's going to be bad people who can take advantage. And how can we do it so that and and you and and you can't always, but I mean, I think you have to take bad motives into account and then design things such that you prevent as much as possible how to how something can be taken advantage of and i i really like the what richard started off with is that people have to have a reason to collaborate and sometimes people are like well sure i understand that x person or x social media site is reading everything i do whatever all my friends are on there i'm doing this so, so it, it, we're all human beings. <laughs> okay, end of story. I, I was just going back on one of the points that Wes made, actually, and I think it's very interesting. I wanted to sort of uh, correlate this to sort of the GDPR that happened a few years ago. And I know that's a layer above what we're discussing here, but I think the impact of that was quite interesting that certainly for me, raised a lot of awareness about how much data uh, companies are gathering about you. But as far as I can tell, it does nothing to actually help the end user. It just sort of says, this is a massive problem. There's very little you can actually do because all of these sites pop up these sort of boxes and without spending 10 minutes trying to work out what you're actually signing stuff up for, it's really very hard to know. Um, so again, I think in terms of user interfaces and things, I think that's a critical issue here is how do we get um, users being able to make a meaningful choice on these. How do we even know what the right default behavior is for these end users? Certainly, when I was giving a talk about uh, encrypted client hello at work, I actually asked some questions about how much do people, uh, this is to network engineers and software engineers, how much do people care about privacy versus keeping their money safe versus all these other sorts of constraints and choices? And the conclusion was is they think privacy is great, but they want everything to work. So they don't want to hand off privacy, but they do also want all these other things. They don't want to have their bank accounts hacked. They don't want to have all these scams and things going on. So how do you um, get users to make an informed decision? And even for the ITF is how do we get an informed decision about what end users want into the protocols we're designing? Because at the moment it feels like we're basing a lot of our decisions on what we think is right as engineers and what our uh, companies are saying we should do. I'm not entirely sure that we're necessarily always getting the end users' opinions uh, uh, fully taking that fully into consideration in the sort of discussions we're having. And I think it's important to me to uh, for me to sort of understand what ways we get more of those views into the ITF. Yeah, for sure, uh, Miriam. Yeah, I, I'm, I don't want to disagree. I just want to say that not all interactions require this kind of uh user direct user interactions right away right because like designing these user interfaces is like a really hard job and when you can avoid it you should avoid it and like the things we've been talking about like zero rating usually what a user does is they have a contract where zero rating is part of the contract so i would assume if they you know if they have the opportunity to zero rate something they want it because it's what they're paying for um similarly uh, parental control is also some it's a service that you're asking for on like a contract basis, right? It's not on a pair interaction basis that you do these kind of things. And then talking about this performance enhancement stuff that is that Michael was talking about, these are kind of completely independent of the user. It's really more about what the application, what are the requirements of the application, right? And of course the user wants to have a well-working application. 
so not all of these have direct user um, interactions uh, or like at least not on a on a per flow level or whatever. Maybe there's like some gross grain part of your contract thing. Great. Um, Wes, you're up next. Um, so thanks, Rob, for bringing up GDPR. I think that's actually a fantastically interesting use case um, because it is such a it is such a mixed bag of, of results. You know, in the in the ways that it, it was designed to protect users, it actually did a, a really good job. Um, you know, when I think about the choices of having every website prompting with that stupid little dialog box, the dialog boxes have actually gotten better. To Miria's point, right, as as the user interface has changed over time, I love the newer ones that you know basically give you two buttons: one is accept all, and the other one is you know take you to a screen where they've defaulted to turn off all of the the nasty ones, and then you can just click one more button. Uh, when you had to manually tweak all the sliders that was a bit more of a pain so we're I think there's a trajectory there that we're sort of heading in the right direct in, in trajectory but the downside of GDPR is very much seen in, in ICANN so for for reference I'm, I'm an ICANN board member now and, and heavily on the ICANN's uh, discussion list is how do we deal with the fact that GDPR has completely blocked the use of who is which from a security operations perspective of which I've sat in many many security operations centers we can no longer, uh, you know, actually look up information about domains and things like that, 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 you know, our users are directly being impacted by. And so, you know, at the same time that GDPR has really, really helped out, it's actually really, really hurt because network operators can no longer help protect users, you know, by, by looking up information about what they're trying to do and what they're trying to see and how to contact, you know, uh, malicious sites or how to contact abuse uh, and things like that. So um, I don't have an answer there. I'm just rambling endlessly and I'll stop now. Yeah, I'm, I, I guess I um, had this note quite a while ago in the discussion, but it's really relevant now, which is that also, even if you could obtain meaningful consent or have some idea of what end users want, that changes over time. So they also need to be empowered to change their mind at some point. And that's also pretty challenging if you equate service provision with some sort of blanket consent and and you might change your services you might change what that means for them and then give them a notice but there's rarely an opportunity to actually change one's consent or to remove that it's really hard so you know defaults therefore matter quite a bit um and i like the um proposals that have come about where you're actually trying to align what users want with some form of meaningful consent. That's probably as close as you're going to get. Um, but then what happens for the default, right? What happens for folks that don't go out of their way to opt in? I think we have to be really, really clear on what would be an acceptable default for almost everything. And I would say in the public interest, that would tend to be not just privacy preserving, but also, as you mentioned, Rob, like security conscious, because that I think is they're very, very similar um, from a from a user perspective in terms of um, how encryption is used. And then the last one that isn't talked enough about, but matters a lot um, in certain countries at the moment, which is access to information. So encryption also pr allows for not just people to keep their information safe, but to actually get information that would otherwise be blocked for them. So folks in Iran right now, folks in Russia, Ukraine, and elsewhere are constantly um, needing encryption to get access to content. So it isn't only just about their own privacy or their own security. It can sometimes be a tool um, needed for um, you know, information integrity and security. So I, I guess I have a whole lot of these, <laughs> whole lot of these thoughts, but it's really, really appreciate um, I won't take the bait on who is though, Wes. We'll have to take that offline. I'm not going to waste your time with my thoughts on who is right now. I think I was not the last one. Thank you. Sorry. Um, uh, Colin, you're after me. Go ahead. Hi. Yeah. Um, I think what one thing that is not necessarily coming across from this discussion is, is that these various privacy and proxying protocols um, change who has access to the data. They don't necessarily provide privacy. Um, 
And I, I, I worry, I mean, sort of echoing some of the comments that Nalini made, I, I worry that we're, we're setting ourselves up to introduce protocols which are pitched as being for privacy. Um, the media gets hold of the fact that it provides access to a certain group uh, and then um, that they are uh, then, you know, the, the way they are presented to the society at large is a, as a snooping protocol. And um, we, we need to be careful how things are presented and be be, ex be more explicit than perhaps we are being about how they change who has access. Then, okay, Michael's out of the queue at Torless. You're next. So Kenny Patterson uh, once uh, said very nicely with tongue in cheek uh, that any cryptographic problem can be solved through a sufficient number of trusted third party. And if we think about the um, problems that we've talked about here of uh, user privacy and what users want, I think ultimately uh, most users don't know what they want and what they get out of it. So there needs to be a trusted third party that represents um, or explains to the users and uh, you know, give or take all these other parties like the European Union trying to do this with GDPR. I think we should talk about what is the position that we as the IETF would want to have, right? So I think we started out for a very long time focusing on uh, privacy and uh, through encryption. Um, I think, first of all, I'm not sure whether we're communicating that very well in terms of what that exactly gives to really actual users as opposed to inside baseball, you know, uh, companies in the industry. And then the second question is whether um, that scope is uh, broad enough to really serve the user well. So if I'm looking at the discussion that we had right now, I think to me, you know, the opposite side of privacy is always transparency. And in, in that respect, I as a user would really love to have more transparency of the services that I'm getting, right? So as, especially that you don't know where your data goes, you don't know what service you're actually getting, especially when you're starting to relinquish certain information. So there is a lot more than uh, just, you know, the privacy that we could do on uh, type kind of the the uh, things we would like to see networks doing for the users in the future. But even if we just take stick to privacy, I think you know what's our way to communicate that better to actual end users. Thanks. Um, I think Nalini, you are next. Go ahead. So I wanted to pick up uh, on what you're saying. So. I think very much there is there's a gap in internet governance, and it's possible that IETF could fit, start to fill some of that role. Like, for example, I I know one hundred percent there are conversations being had because I've been a part of them, where there are governments who are talking about what will and will not be potentially. Uh, policy in the next five years. And in some ways, it's like, if we think GDPR is something, it has to wait, right? Because, I mean, let me give you an example, for example, and I'm not saying this is the conversation I've been a part of, okay? So like, for example, if someone, um, you know, what would it take for certain countries to, to react with inevitable overreach and lack of understanding? Say, for example, in India, some terrorist group takes off uh, a pillar of the Taj Mahal. What do you think the Indian government is going to do, right? And 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 I think I think what is happening right now is if you and, and I don't want to get distracted a little bit on the on the who is because those are certainly conversations that have been had too. It's like it's like wait a minute, wait a minute. Law enforcement needs who is and. And so I think in some ways, I, I don't know how to do this. Um, I, I have some ideas, obviously. Um, um, but, but I think there needs to be a forum where some of the implications of things like what we're talking about need to be explained in a way that people can understand because otherwise, I'm just going to say in the next five years, we're likely to see 
governments react towards some of these things in unfortunate ways. Um, others want to jump in. We have uh, just a time check. We have about four minutes left for um, today's workshop. So I liked what Colin said about uh, about changing who has access. And one of the things that I've worried about with all of the proxy related solutions that, <coughs> excuse me, add privacy is uh, it is changing the way we, ha the, you know, changing who has access and more importantly, it's actually driving centralization of a lot of those proxies because there, there's not many proxies that are trying to get to a lot of other places. So all the data goes to one place. Um, I think DNS and Cloudflare are, you know, a good example of one that people have worried about or DNS and Google for that matter have worried about because, you, you know, you are sending all of your requests to one place and you're assuming that they're going to be good. A lot of proxies also assume that there won't be collusion. So one of the things that, you know, we should talk about, I, th I think, in this forum is um, we all believe that these two entities will never, co you know, collude when the reality is, A, they might be motivated to do so, as somebody said earlier, everything is always financially driven. Um, I, I mentioned in chat that sliding terms of service, you know, constraints are always a problem as well. And, you know, so just because just because some entity starts off being benign does not mean that they won't turn malicious. And we haven't talked about that sort of trend yet either. Absolutely. Um, go ahead, Colin, you're back in the queue. Yeah, I, I think uh, following on from Nalini's point, it's not, I think it's not just governments who don't understand what we're doing. Um, um, we're, we're changing the way the architecture works in reasonably significant ways, and it's shifting um, who has access and what are the privacy um, and um, security trade-offs quite, quite significantly. Uh, and I'm not sure that, that much of the industry or, or the wider society is understanding how it's shifting. Um, we're, we're not very good at outreach, and, and we saw this um, biting us over HTT, over uh, D DNS over HTTPS. And I'm wondering if we're going to see some similar concerns with some of the protocols we're developing here. We should maybe try and get better at outreach. Yeah. Yeah, very good point. Um, so yeah, I guess we'll start moving to wrapping up just because I know you've um, all generously given your time for the last couple of hours. We have um, Wes, who is chairing tomorrow's session, which I am really sad to say I will miss um, for um, unavoidable conflict reasons, but I'm looking forward to the notes and glad that these are being recorded. Um, any final words or shall we just, yeah, see you all online um, for tomorrow? I don't know if there's any other announcements. I don't think so from the program committee or from I, th I think we're good. Thanks very much for sharing today, Mallory. I think the discussion was highly interesting and the presentation. Thanks to the presenters as well. Absolutely. It keeps getting better and better. So, yeah, looking forward to more. Bye, everybody. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks to the organizers. Talk to you all tomorrow.